Just to let you know, this episode contains very strong language. Please be advised. Matt, I've been waiting for hours. You're never late. What is going on? I'm sorry. I mean, it's the most incredible story. You're not going to believe it. Yeah, I mean, I did see photos online. You had a big night out last night, I presume. No, 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 not at all. No, no, no. I went out for dinner, just went to get a salad, as I always do. I get kidnapped by MI5. Right, yeah. Then, I mean, the van, it gets rolled over by these gangsters who then bundle me out of the truck. MI5, they execute everyone, right? And then I, I, I make a break for it. And then Al-Qaeda get involved. Al-Qaeda. Al -Qaeda, the Al-Qaeda. Yeah. And then I managed to somehow get away from them. This And I've just been walking through the night. I mean, I think they left me somewhere outside of Leeds and I've just walked down the motorway to get here. OK, bit of advice that somebody told me. Only tell a lie as big as you need. So friend to friend, eye to eye, did you just lie to me? <sighs> OK, I didn't have a salad. It was a kebab. August 1977. Kalini, Ireland. Judy Lane sinks into an armchair, puts her feet up on the stool in front of her. She picks up a nearby copy of Mother and Baby magazine and gently strokes her small baby bump. She startles as the wind catches one of the shutters outside the small rented cottage. Judy realises a window is ajar. She goes over to close it. As she does, she hears the snap of a twig outside. She squints through the darkness. Hello? The only sound Judy is met with is another gust of wind. Judy slams the window shut, eyes the clock on the wall, now alert to how isolated she is in this small coastal suburb. Howard is taking a load of Thai cannabis to the docks and he's been gone for hours. She thought he'd be back by now. Judy returns to her chair, distracts herself with the magazine, is soon dozing off, only to be jolted awake by a loud pounding on the door. She tentatively rises from the armchair to answer. Howard! She stands for a moment next to the door, listens, but all she can hear is her own breathing. She tells herself to stop being stupid and yanks it open. On the other side is a stranger. He wears a trench coat belted tightly across his generous beer gut. Before she can slam the door shut, he pushes past her and rushes inside. Where's that Welsh fucking arsehole? Jehovah's Witnesses in Ireland are so direct. <laughs> That's not going to sell you a watchtower, is it? <laughs> At the sound of his Irish accent, Judy's stomach turns. She knows Howard's been doing his latest deal with someone who has links to the IRA. She tries to stay calm. Howard... He's not here. I don't know where he is. The man glares at her. I bet you knew what he was up to, you fucking English bitch. As the man shouts, the stench of beer fills the room. He's drunk. Judy's eyes move to the block of knives in the kitchen. She slowly backs away from him, places a protective hand across her belly as she does. Listen, if you just wait for Howard, I I'm, I'm sure... Her voice trails off as the man steps towards her then reaches inside his coat, pulls out a pistol. <gasps> Judy gasps. He holds the barrel so close it practically touches her forehead. Please don't. I'm pregnant. To her horror, he grins maniacally and moves the gun towards her abdomen. Judy starts to shake uncontrollably. The last three years with Howard flash through her mind. Her head slumps forward in resignation. This has always been the way this was going to end. All she can do is squeeze her eyes shut and wait for the inevitable. It's me, The Grinch. My new podcast, Tis The Grinch Holiday Talk Show, is out now. And it's already been voted best podcast of all time by the residents of Whoville. So tune in and turn up the volume for a hilariously bad time. Listen to Tis the Grinch Holiday Talk Show on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. From Wondery, I'm Alice Levine. And I'm Matt Ford. And this is British Scandal. We deal, Matt, 
in unsavoury characters on this show, I think it's fair to say. But how do you feel about Howard Marks? A bit conflicted because the scale of his law-breaking is anxiety-inducing and, of course, it's against the law, so don't (laughs) do it. That's my general view. But there's something about him that makes me feel differently. I just kind of... He's won me over. I mean, you can see why he's done well, can't you? He is unfeasibly charismatic. He's very smart and he has just this very easy way about him, which may be the cloud of smoke that surrounds him or might just be his natural aptitude for high adrenaline situations and keeping cool in moments of extreme pressure. And that's what leads him to just be so audacious. I mean, the moment when he fakes his own kidnapping is absolutely incredible. At this point, as far as the authorities are concerned, the bloke's disappeared. But obviously with Howard, you just never know how long the scam's going to last. Can you imagine if this episode was just him? Not here. (laughs) For the whole thing. Nope, still can't find him. Let's see if we can smoke him out. This is episode two, Bonnie and Clyde. September 1974, Brighton. Howard breathes deep, feels the salt air hit his face. It's good to be back on British soil. He spent the last few months on the run in Europe, hoping for the media storm to die down. But he's still front page news. He anxiously checks his disguise in a window, bushy moustache and specks in place. He needs to get to his bolt hole, his accountant's small flat in Kemptown. Ten minutes later, he climbs the metal stairs of a tall building's fire escape. Howard knows his accountant spends every summer in the Dordogne, leaving his flat empty. It's the perfect place to lie low. He scans the building's facade and is delighted to see one of the windows slightly ajar. He pushes it open, climbs into the kitchen and immediately feels a thud to the back of his head. The pain seems to split his skull. He stumbles back towards the window, only to look up and see a young woman holding a massive telephone directory. I'll do it again. I know Kung Fu. Back then, everything was a weapon. Stuff was just heavier. Like if someone (laughs) broke into my house now, what would I actually chuck at them? Even the TV's dead light. Even routers are quite thin now. People don't even have telephone directories anymore. You just have to throw your iPhone at them. It's actually quite painful, as Naomi Campbell's assistant would attest. (laughs) Howard steadies his feet, tries to focus on the girl in front of him. She's draped in a floaty caftan and multiple necklaces. With her skinny limbs, wispy, waist-length blonde hair and wide eyes, she looks like she couldn't hurt a fly. But he panics when she reaches for the phone. I mean, that's another thing going in his favour. It took ages. Nine <laughs> is the furthest number away. It took a half an hour to dial 999 on one of those old things. You just got tired and gave up, didn't you? No, like, Siri, call the police. And they're immediately there. Hey, Siri, call the police. And she's like, playing you, Calvin Harris. You're like, oh! Playing the police. <laughs> no! Fuck! Oh. Please, please, don't call the police. I'm a friend of Patrick's. I'm sorry. I thought the flat was free. The girl's fingers hover over the dial. He said I could stay here while he's on his snail farm in France. The girl eyes him suspiciously, then replaces the receiver. I'm Judy, his sister. Howard smiles, relieved. I'm Howard. Judy's eyes widen. Howard inwardly curses. He hadn't thought to give a false name. He eyes Judy's hand, still so close to the phone. He prepares to run. But then, Judy lets out a shriek. Oh my God, this is wild. Patrick and I thought you'd been kidnapped or murdered. He's been worried sick. I want to hear everything. Howard lets himself collapse against the kitchen cabinet, relieved. Sure, but maybe a cuppa first? I'm gasping. This is so 70s. They'll be on a waterbed in no time. (laughs) Soon the pair are chatting away at the kitchen table. Howard half listens as Judy tells him she's 19 and has recently dropped out of college to spend a few months in Ibiza. In truth, he can't take his eyes off her. The more she talks, the more smitten he becomes. He tells her why he deals pot. I don't use or sell anything stronger, and I never will. But sharing cannabis with the world, that's my mission. Getting stoned is a beautiful thing. Being a drug dealer, I always just saw it as kind of a vocational thing, really. (laughs) It was either this or the priesthood. So in many ways, it's a kind of altruistic move, 
It's grassroots outreach, and that pun wasn't intended. Judy smiles, reaching over to a nearby ashtray. She picks up a half-smoked joint. Howard watches as she takes it in her delicate fingers and takes a deep drag before passing it to him. Kemptown's finest. You need to watch it. These new kids will put you out of business. Howard laughs as he takes a drag. Judy's not wrong. But right now, he doesn't care. All he wants to do is get to know this girl better. Three weeks later, October 1974, Brighton. Judy stretches her legs out as she props herself up in bed. She watches as Howard slowly opens his dazzling blue eyes, gives her a lazy, sensuous smile and pulls her under the covers. These last few weeks with Howard have felt like a dream. Just the two of them hold up here. Since her mum died a few years ago, Judy's felt lost and unfocused. Her whirlwind romance with Howard has been the perfect antidote, an exciting distraction from her privileged but directionless life. We're running low on gear. I'll do the paper run. Judy weaves her way through Brighton's lanes. She nods hello to several friends, many of whom are owners of her favourite shops selling colourful caftans and homemade hash pipes. She enters the back room of one to meet her dealer and score an eighth. On the way home, she picks up a copy of the Daily Mirror. Judy grins at the sight of Howard on the front page again, reads the story as she walks, then stops in her tracks. It states Howard is right here, in Brighton. Judy looks around, panicked. She has to go back to the flat and warn Howard. She's panting by the time she puts the key in the lock, but then she begins to shake. It's no longer the fear of Howard being captured. She can't bear the thought of waking up without him by her side. Judy goes over to the bed and sits down, her heart thudding in her chest. Howard looks into her eyes, concerned. What's wrong, babe? His eyes move to the paper Judy has removed from her bag. She feels his body tense as he reads it. Before she can say anything, he jumps from the bed and begins throwing his belongings into a bag. She doesn't know what to do. Then she hears herself shout, Wait! Howard looks at her. For a moment, Judy isn't sure what to say. Then it just comes out. I'm coming with you. Judy blocks out any thought of what she'll tell her family, her friends. She loves it here in Brighton. It's the only place that's ever felt truly her own. But somehow, none of that seems to matter right now. All she wants is to be where Howard is. But he shakes his head. You can't, Jude. If we got caught, I don't care. Judy eyeballs him, adamant. Howard hesitates, his eyes filling with tears. Judy prepares herself for an argument. I'm not ready for this to be over. Are you? She sees Howard smile, then step forward, pulling her towards him. She's never felt safer, nor surer of her decision. Moments later, they're throwing her clothes into the bag with Howard's, bundling out of the flat. Judy knows this is the craziest thing she's ever done, but she's never felt so alive. As they veer down the stairs and out into the street, Hand in hand, she pushes aside any second thoughts. Whatever comes next, she just hopes she can handle it. This feels like a classic British scandal fork in the road. It's a tale as old as time, certainly in this show. And particularly lovers going on the run. We love a lover on the run, don't we? We do, but surely when you go on the run, you've got to come back at some point. You can't just run forever. Wow, that's so profound. And who are you really running from? The police? Or yourself? Whoa. I was thinking more of Forrest Gump. (laughs) So you were more thinking in a kind of tired way. Literally, yeah. I mean, you just can't run forever. (laughs) Mo Farrell will tell you that. (laughs) January 1975. Liverpool. (laughs) Howard slams the payphone into its holder trudges across the field of the dark campsite. He's just been talking to his old contact, Ernie Coombs, about getting back to work in the States. With funds running low, he needs a proper income, and there's still too much heat for him to smuggle drugs into the UK. When he enters his small camper van, he immediately calms. He takes in the heady smell of lavender and jasmine, the dim candlelight. 
Judy has managed to make their beaten-up VW feel more like a romantic boudoir than a secret hideout. Without her, being on the run would have been unbearable. But if they're going to carry on seeing each other, he has to be honest about his plans. Listen, Jude, Ernie's deals are getting bigger all the time. I want in, but it's going to mean a whole new identity. Judy throws him a mischievous smile. I don't mind a little role play, Howie. Judy, please. This is serious. I'd need a new passport with paperwork to back it up. And even then, if I find a way to get that, the penalties for dealing pot in the US. Howard trails off as he looks at her. We're talking years, even for an accessory. Judy's smile fades now. What are you saying? That you don't want me to come? You'd have to take on a new identity too. Cut all ties here. This can't just be a holiday, Jude. We'd be going for good. Judy turns away. Howard can't tell if it's from defiance or the realisation of what this would involve. He takes her hand, softens his voice. Of course I want you there. I just want you to know what you're getting into. Judy nods. She seems unsure now. I'll be at the on-site bar. Come and find me when you've made a decision. I so 70s. I mean, now what would people say? I'm going to get some bubble tea. <laughs> I'm going to go to this escape room. I'll only be an hour. Vape. Maybe do a Pilates class. Do a Pilates class and have a vape. Clear the mind. <laughs> An hour later, Howard has barely touched his cider when a young woman walks in. He does a double take. It's Judy, but she's barely recognisable. She wears a floor-length smock, a flower wreath is wrapped around her flowing locks, and she's added a bindi to her forehead. She's wearing a different outfit. She's basically just dressed for Coachella. She strides over to a couple in the corner and introduces herself. Hi, I'm Jude. This might sound crazy, but I've got this really good vibe about you guys. I read palms. Do you want to know what your future holds? Howard sees the couple stare at her in confusion, but Judy smiles at them reassuringly. I'll only ask you to cross my palm if you're happy when I'm done. To Howard's amazement, they invite Judy to sit down. Howard watches as she studies their palms, makes guesses at their names, their dates and places of birth. When she gets it wrong, they correct her. She subtly asks if they've ever travelled abroad, whether they drive. It doesn't take Howard long to work out what her game is. Half an hour later, back at the camper van, Howard looks at the piece of tatty paper in Judy's hand, covered top to bottom in her writing. It's all the information they need to apply for a set of passports. Howard grins. You are a natural crook. Well, I'm learning from the master. Howard looks at his fellow fugitive and smiles. Whatever adventures lie ahead, he knows he's got the right woman by his side. May 1977, Studio 54, New York City. Judy takes in her surroundings, awestruck. She and Howard have been in the States for over a year now but she hasn't seen anything like this. It's not just the striking decor, the disco balls hanging from the ceiling. It's the endless lines of coke strewn across the tables, the naked couples writhing on the large balcony, overlooking the room. Judy has been introduced to Andy Warhol and Liza Minnelli. Now Mick and Bianca Jagger listen intently as Howard regales them with another elaborate tale. Back in the 60s, MI6 came knocking on my door. I thought the game was up. Turns out, they wanted me to spy for them. No way, man! Wait a sec, I can't do Mick Jagger. This is your crowning impression. Well, I was going to say, I think this is the first time that both of us have impersonated the same character on a different series. To call what I just did impersonating, I think, is to bring down the whole profession. (laughs) Not only has Howard been able to come out of the shadows over here, he's actively celebrated by the countercultural elite. They're having a blast travelling all over the US for Howard's various deals. As they step into a limousine and speed towards the airport, Judy reminds him of his latest identity. He laughs as he opens the passport. Donald Nice. That's great. I'm going to enjoy being Mr Nice. So this is where it came from, I didn't realise. 
He looks deep into Judy's eyes. I want you with me at this meeting in Miami. These guys are big on family. It's time they met the woman in my life. A few hours later, they enter a lavish suite at the upmarket Fontainebleau Hotel, where two smartly dressed men and their girlfriends are waiting. One of the men looks her up and down, lingering on her cleavage. Judy struggles to hide her discomfort. Is this who Howard does business with? She wishes she could leave, but she can't let Howard down. Instead, she sits and waits for the joint being passed around to reach her. When it does, she takes a deep drag, desperate to calm her nerves. The pot is stronger than usual, and Judy instantly feels lightheaded. The garish interior of the room starts to spin. Judy's suddenly convinced everyone is staring at her, laughing. She forces herself to her feet, swaying. Sorry, I just... I I need to use the restroom. Judy feels the eyes on her as she stumbles towards the bathroom. She tries to steady herself, stay calm, but finds herself staring at the men again. Their slicked back hair, sharp suits, Italian-American accents. She feels like she's in some horrible mobster film. Her fears returning, Judy tries to pick up the pace. She needs to get into that bathroom. She needs to feel safe. But her legs buckle. She hits the floor with a thud. Everything goes black. When Judy opens her eyes, she's in a different suite, with Howard standing over her. She feels a surge of relief. For fuck's sake, what was that? You embarrass me and yourself. Howard smashes his fist on the glass coffee table beside him. It shatters with the force. As blood seeps from his hand, Judy recoils. As if realising what he's done, he rushes over to her. God, babe, I'm so sorry. I, I never should have brought you here. All these deals, it's been so mad. I don't know who I am sometimes. Judy studies him. She's never seen this side of Howard. Unsure what to do, she takes him in her arms, holds him close. But for the first time, she finds herself questioning. Howard might be nice by name, but is he really nice by nature? Hey listeners, it's Mr. Ballin here, and I'm here to tell you about my brand new podcast. It's called Mr. Ballin's Medical Mysteries. Why Medical Mysteries? Well, we've all been there. Turning to the internet to self-diagnose our inexplicable pains, debilitating body aches, sudden fevers, and strange rashes. Though our minds tend to spiral to worst-case scenarios, it's usually nothing. But for an unlucky few, these unsuspecting symptoms can start the clock ticking on a terrifying medical mystery. Like the unexplainable death of a retired firefighter whose body was found at home by his son, except it looked like he had been cremated. Or the time when an entire town became ill with nausea and chills, and the local doctor chalked it up to being food poisoning until people started jumping from buildings and seeing tigers on their ceilings. Each terrifying true story will be sure to keep you up at night. Follow Mr. Ballin's Medical Mysteries wherever you get your podcasts. Prime members can listen early and ad-free on Amazon Music. August 1977. Hollyhead, Wales. Howard curses as the traffic inches slowly towards the port up ahead. This is taking far longer than he'd hoped. He turns on the radio, but the signal's weak. He flicks it off again, frustrated. Judy insisted they return home after the Miami debacle, her surprise pregnancy sealing the deal. They've decided to settle in Dublin, and with the British hunt for him now all but forgotten... Howard's also reunited with old IRA contact Jim McCann, trafficking 750 kilos of Thai sticks to Liverpool docks. Thai sticks? They sound pretty harmless. They sound just like incense. Or even something that might come with a dipping sauce. Ooh, lovely. But as always, dealing with McCann has led to trouble. McCann's Irish distributors have let him down. Unless he wants all that grass sitting in McCann's van outside his rented cottage in Kalini. Howard has no choice but to help him deliver the load himself. Inching his car forward, Howard eyes McCann's vehicle up ahead. He's horrified to see 
he's being questioned by two officials. Howard leans out of the window, trying to make out what's going on. One of the men glances his way. Howard's heart pounds. He shouldn't be doing this anymore. Thinking fast, he turns the car around, drives to the nearest forest and dumps the rest of the load. OK, that solves the short-term problem of not being caught with drugs. But doesn't it create a long-term problem of having got rid of drug dealers' drugs and not having money for the drug dealers? I think you raise a very fair point there. I mean, thinking fast being the important part of that sentence. Yes, he saved time on the decision-making, but it feels like dumping thousands and thousands of pounds worth of drugs, not your money necessarily, is probably going to have some repercussions. I know they say don't get high on your own supply, but surely don't junk someone else's skunk. That's actually very good. I mean, you could have various ones. Don't dump your gear and disappear. (laughs) Don't drive off at speed having dumped someone else's weed. I think we've got some bumper stickers coming up. Then he returns to the cottage on foot. Howard exhales as he sees the warm lights of the cottage get closer, thinks of Judy and the baby. When he enters, he stops dead in his tracks. McCann is there, waving a pistol at a terrified Judy. Howard, thank God! Howard runs across the room, pushing McCann as far away from Judy as possible. Now McCann points the gun at him. You fucking Welsh arsehole! You set me up! Howard smells the alcohol on his breath. This is the drink talking. He keeps his cool. Jim, no one set you up. I'm as in the dark about what happened as you are. It wasn't my distributors that let us down. It was yours. McCann seems to register what he's saying. When Howard sees him calm down, he jumps forward and takes the gun from his hand assuring him they'll get to the bottom of why he was stopped. By the time he's finished talking, McCann is patting him on the back and laughing. After ushering him out, Howard returns to a sobbing Judy. McCann's bark is worse than his bite. He wouldn't have hurt you. Judy stares at him in disbelief. Can you hear yourself? He pointed a gun at me, at our child. We left the States to get away from this, Howard. Jude, you're overreacting. But Judy's already storming up the stairs. Howard collapses on the couch, rolls a much-needed joint, takes a deep drag. What the hell is he doing, exposing Judy and their baby to lunatics like McCann? He vows to himself that from now on, he'll stick to professional outfits. And he'll cut Judy out of the loop, make sure she's not troubled by this stuff. That way, he'll keep getting the money, the thrill of the deal without all the domestic drama. He'll keep getting everything he wants. December 1978, Knightsbridge, London. In their luxury penthouse apartment, Judy holds one-year-old Amber in her arms. She points out of the window, at the colourful lights, illuminating what she and Howard affectionately refer to as their corner shop, Harrods. See, I'm struggling with the story now because it's a little bit like footballers. When they're on the way up, you're like, I want you to have everything. God, your talent deserves it. When they get a little bit too big for their boots, you think, oh, no, it's ruined you. I mean, that is ludicrous. At the dining table nearby, Howard pours over pages of paperwork, stabbing numbers into his calculator. Howard doesn't tell Judy much about his dealings these days, but eyeing their 10-foot Christmas tree in the corner... She knows business must be good. She takes Amber over to the oversized couch and switches on the TV. Picking up a nearby bottle of sherry, she's about to pour herself a glass when a news story captures her attention. All the young men found dead were missing the little finger from their left hand, leading Japanese police to conclude they belonged to the infamous Yakuza crime syndicate. Judy feels a knot in her stomach. She's heard Howard mention that organisation during conversations with Ernie. She takes in the images on the screen, a dark mass of dead bodies. It's thought the mass execution was the work of a rival gang. Judy pulls Amber to her side, clutches her tightly. She can't bear the thought that Howard is in business with these people and that he may be heading for the same fate. As Howard walks over to join her, she can't stay silent. Howard, those people... Howard follows her gaze to the TV, shrugs coolly. 
I don't do business with them, Jude. Judy eyeballs him, almost daring him to lie to her face again. Now he rolls his eyes. What do you want me to say? For fuck's sake, Judy. I've never lied about who I am. Says the man with multiple false identities. <laughs> Quite. Judy thinks back to their first meeting in Kemptown, when Howard told her that his mission was sharing cannabis with the world. Even if that's still true, what does it matter if the people he's dealing with are selling hard drugs? And much worse. Howard starts to walk away, but Judy won't be so easily dismissed. You have a child now, Howard. I need to know she's safe. This isn't just a few dope deals anymore. Howard glares at her, almost spitting out his words now. It's this business that pays for that bloody television on the wall, Judy. Don't play innocent in all this. And I'm telling you, I can't live with it anymore. When Judy starts to sob, Amber begins crying as well. Howard falters. He sits down now, takes her hand. Look, Judy, I have this current job. If it comes off, we'll be set for life. This is for you and Amber. Judy leaps on that, realising this is her chance. So if it comes off, you'll retire? Howard hesitates before answering. Yeah, I suppose. Mm, it's not a hard yes, is it? Swear on my life, Howard. And Amber's. Howard doesn't show a flicker of hesitation now. I swear. Judy nods, but try as she might, she can't quieten that niggling doubt that Howard is too deep to ever give up. May 1980, Scotland Yard, London. In a small room deep in the bowels of the building, customs officer Michael Stevenson listens intently to the call he's just intercepted. Walter, it's Donald. Pete told me you were in town. Can we meet? Sure, we'll see you at the location in Sky. We want to do a stock take. It's better if we meet in London. Where are you staying? That is a smart move, because if you're going to be meeting with dangerous gangsters, do it in a crowded, busy place, not on a remote island. Again, this is going in Matt's big list of how to be a drug dealer. Piccadilly Circus, midday. Are you arranging a meet? Just saying, Piccadilly Circus midday. <laughs> you know who you are. Yeah, see you there. Stevenson scribbles down the Dorchester Hotel as the phone clicks off. Then he rewinds the tape and listens again. For the past two months, the British dope market has been saturated and Stevenson's department has been putting all its resources into finding out why. So when two known associates of the Traficante crime family who regularly export marijuana from Colombia into the US, arrived at Heathrow yesterday. UK Customs immediately put them under surveillance. The Traficante crime family. Come on, please. It's real. It's proper nominative determinism, that. It is proper nominative determinism, that. <laughs> We're either going to do that or become traffic wardens. <laughs> Stevenson has been monitoring calls to their hotel rooms ever since, but this is his first lead. He nervously approaches his DCI. Gov, these Americans we've been tracking, you're not going to believe who their British contact is. Half an hour later, Stevenson flashes his badge at the Dorchester's receptionist. Officer Stevenson, customs and excise. Oh, I need to know the room number for two guests. He makes his way to the third floor, creeping along the corridor until he's outside the room. Stevenson's intention isn't to burst in, it's only to confirm his suspicions. If he's right, they'll need to increase their surveillance, make damn sure they have enough to make any charges stick. He puts his ear to the door. He hears muffled voices, the same accents he heard earlier on the phone. He lifts his quivering hand to move the brass disc covering the keyhole, then places his eye over it, focusing on the figures inside. There are three of them, Stevenson recognises the two Americans from their mugshots. The other he knows for a different reason. From police files, press cuttings and TV news bulletins. The face, the voice, the shaggy hair. It's him. Stevenson's heart practically stops. He's just found Howard Marks. Now he just needs to catch him in the act. The following day, in a Hebrides, Scotland. Oh, mate. What happened to Piccadilly Circus at midday? 
<laughs> one rule. Actually, there's several rules, but yeah. for this particular situation, one rule. In a remote lockup on the Isle of Skye, Howard paces anxiously as two men painstakingly count the tightly wrapped packages of hash piled on the table. As they reach the end of the process, they start all over again. Howard sighs. Count it as many times as you like. It's still going to add up the same. The men ignore him. Howard tries to hide his frustration. The deal with the traficantes has gone like clockwork. 50 tonnes of the highest quality Colombian weed arrived here in March, the largest amount ever imported into Europe. It's enough to get every person in the UK stoned. Howard's never been prouder. But sales have been slow, and now the family is worried that not all the dope has been distributed, so these goons have come over to investigate. Howard checks his watch, impatient. Finally, one of the men puts his calculator away. OK, it's all here. Internally, Howard breathes a sigh of relief. Once back on the Scottish mainland, he finds a phone box and calls Ernie to tell him everything is sorted. Then he makes his way to the Swan Hotel in Lavenham, Suffolk, where he's meeting Judy and Amber for a long weekend. On the drive, Howard thinks about the promise he's made to Judy about retiring. He hadn't meant it at the time, but after the last few days, it doesn't seem like such a bad idea. He's financially secure. In addition to the 25 tonnes of marijuana and hashish he's trafficked over the last year, Donald Nice is managing director of several offshore companies, as well as legitimate businesses, including a prosperous wine importation firm and a paper mill. By the time he reaches the Swan, Howard has made up his mind to at least take a break. It's time to enjoy the fruits of his labour for a while. Heading into the bar, he's warmed by the sight of Amber toddling towards him, arms outstretched. He scoops her up, then kisses Judy, who welcomes him with a sherry. Thanks, babe. I need this. Howard takes a sip. He feels the tension of the last few days melt away. A man appears beside him. In the mood to celebrate, Howard is about to ask him what he's having. He might ask the whole bar. But before he can offer him a drink, the man cuts in. Donald Nice, or should I say, Howard Marks. Oh. Howard turns to see another man behind him. The first man holds up a badge. Customs and excise. Before Howard can move, the officer slaps a pair of handcuffs on him. Panicked, Judy turns Amber away, trying to block her view. But not before Howard catches a look of confusion and terror on Amber's face. We're arresting you on suspicion of conspiring to import several tonnes of Colombian marijuana for conspiring to attempt to smuggle cannabis into the US in 1974 and for using fraudulent passports. Howard tries to muster his usual bravado, but it doesn't come. He sinks into his stool. It's time to stop running. He knows from this moment the high life is over and that he's going to need a miracle to get out of this. July 1980, Lullington, East Sussex. Jeremy Hutchinson breathes in the crisp country air as he returns from a long walk. Kicking off his boots and entering his sun-drenched conservatory, the 65-year-old resolves to spend more time here at his idyllic home and less in the stuffy House of Lords. Nice choice to have. Gorgeous. <laughs> his piece is shattered by the shrill ring of the phone. Lord Hutchinson, I'm Bernie Simons. Forgive me for calling you at home. What can I do for you, Mr Simons? I'm Howard Marks' solicitor, and I wondered if you'd consider acting for my client at trial. It's not the first time the distinguished QC has been asked to return to the bar since retiring two years ago. He tells Simons what he tells everyone else. I'm sorry, but my work at the Lords keeps me rather busy. Of course. But can I just ask you meet with Howard? See for yourself whether he's worthy of your time. Hutchinson glances at the front of today's Guardian. It features a photo of beaming remand prisoner Howard and his new bride Judy, taken yesterday outside the Welsh Congregational Chapel in South London. Hutchinson can't help but be impressed 
by Mark's negotiating leave to get married. He thinks about the famous names he's advocated for in the past. Penguin Books in the Lady Chatterley trial, Christine Keeler in the Profumo affair, and notorious MI6 double agent George Blake. Sounds like Hutchinson could conceivably have been in every series of British Scandal. Yeah, and he was, of course, in our Christine Keeler Profumo affair series. In fact, that speech has gone down as being one of the best sum-ups ever at the Old Bailey. He has no intention of taking this case, but Hutchinson can't resist the opportunity to meet the legendary Mr Marks. The following day, entering the private visiting room at Brixton Prison, Hutchinson chuckles at the spread laid out, smoked salmon and caviar in Fortnum and Mason pots, and a bottle of vintage wine. I mean, those prisons had to change. You cannot have dangerous men being treated like it's a holiday camp. That's a lovely spread, though. OK, you will lose your liberty, but you do get a load of Fortnum and Mason hampers. I'd offer you some of my highest quality Kazakhstani hashish, but there are limits to what even I can get in here. Then he leans in, whispers conspiratorially. Though I don't think they spotted the hash in my wedding cake. Hutchinson can't help but be impressed at the man's audacity. He sits back as Howard chats away. It soon becomes clear how Howard got the most cushy job on his wing as tea boy, brewing up for the likes of gangster Ronnie Knight and great train robber Tommy Wisby. The man is great company, but having done his homework, Hutchinson doesn't want to waste Howard's time or his own. He cuts to the chase. I'm afraid that with so much evidence against you, securing an acquittal will be all but impossible. Your best bet is to plead guilty for a reduced sentence. Then you may get seven years rather than the 18 you're likely to serve if found guilty at trial. Hutchinson gathers up his paper, prepares to leave. I'd like to confide in you, Lord Hutchinson, about the great forces that have brought me here. I think you'll find what I have to say interesting. Despite himself, Hutchinson settles back in his seat. What if I were to tell you that, yes, I did smuggle drugs out of Ireland in the early 70s, and I did do this deal with the Colombians, but that both were carried out at the behest of the British establishment. What? Hutchinson listens, stunned, as Howard tells him one of the most fantastical tales he's ever heard. He eyes Howard, sceptically at first, but then with a genuine inquisitiveness. And can you back up any of this? Absolutely. Hutchinson smiles. This man, this case, is so outlandish, so unique and challenging he can't help but start to feel himself cave. What you have just told me is without doubt the most ridiculous defence I've heard in my entire life. You mean you don't believe it? It's not about what's believable. It's about what can be proved. Now he sees a big grin form on Howard's face. The man isn't just charming. In his disdain and distrust of the establishment, he's a kindred spirit. Hutchinson is going to take this last job and he's going to do the impossible. He's going to get Howard Marks off the hook. 28th of September, 1981, the Old Bailey, London. In the public gallery, hand resting on her heavily pregnant belly, Judy watches nervously as the prosecuting counsel, John Rogers QC, rises to his feet and opens the case against her new husband. Members of the jury, for years Mr Marks lived a life of decadence, laughing at the authorities while conducting drug deals under various guises. In fact, he had so many identities, one wonders how on earth he remembered who he was at any given time. Strong opening. The judge smiles. Judy can tell he doesn't like Howard. Rogers goes on. We will show you papers found in Mr. Marx's possession upon his arrest that detail in his own handwriting various quantities, values and destinations for drugs he smuggled. The evidence, frankly, speaks for itself. By the time Howard's defence QC, Lord Hutchinson, rises from his seat, Judy thinks it's surely an open and shut case. But Hutchinson's voice betrays no such doubt. 
Members of the jury, over the course of this trial, you will learn that far from contravening British law, this Oxford graduate was used by MI6 to infiltrate the IRA and entrap one of its gun runners. Just hold on, because I can't tell if they're just going to try the most elaborate ruse of all time or whether I've been terribly naive and not fully appreciated that this might actually be true. You're very much right to doubt what's going on because this sounds like the last gasping breath of a desperate man with a ridiculous, surreal story to try and get himself off the hook. But actually, this is completely true. Howard, you got me. I never saw this coming. As Hutchinson goes on, Judy starts to relax. Of all the elements of this story that have been concocted from Howard's imagination, this colonel is actually true and compelling. The courtroom hangs on Hutchinson's every word. Not content with the risks already imposed on Mr Marx's life, the same agency then forced him to work with the Mexican Secret Service. It was this assignment that led him to infiltrate the Colombian drug world. Not only is Mr Marks an innocent man, he's been let down by the very people who should have protected him, the British establishment. By the time the court adjourns, Judy's buoyant. But away from the theatre of the courtroom, Hutchinson advises caution. This is a high-risk strategy, Judy. MI6 will try to prove they did no such deals with Howard. The prosecution has a witness who will place him in the same room as members of the Colombian drug cartel. And right now, I have no idea if Howard's star witness from the Mexican Secret Service will even turn up. Judy's heart sinks. Hutchinson's right. They can't get carried away. This trial has a long way to go. But she reminds herself just how good Howard is at what he does. She has to believe he can pull this off. His greatest scam yet. October 1981, The Old Bailey, London. Howard rests his hands on the Bible, swears to tell the truth. He's been dying to get in the witness box and have his moment in the spotlight. As Hutchinson runs through his questions, he feels like he did in his early trafficking days. Nervous, but excited. And tell us again, Mr Marx, exactly when the British Intelligence Service asked you to work with their Mexican counterparts. That would have been 1971. That's when I was first given false identities and passports. But it wasn't until 1978 that I found myself working with double agents on the Colombian deal. The Mexicans were convinced that a Marxist terrorist organisation, the September 23 Communist League, were financing their activities and importing drugs. I was getting very close to the truth when I was arrested. The judge throws his hands up in despair. Mr Marx, I find it extraordinarily difficult to follow your evidence. I'm getting lost in a mass of detail. How the jury copes, I just do not know. Howard fights to hide his delight. This is all part of their strategy, to convince the jury that such a detailed, outrageous story surely can't be one big bluff. Howard certainly got everything he hoped for from Hutchinson. Not only has the QC forced a policeman into admitting that Howard's links to MI6 are real, but his discrediting of the prosecution's star witness was utterly brutal. But that may not be enough. The jury remains unreadable. As he leaves the witness box, all he knows is he's thrown everything at this case. Now, it's out of his hands. Six hours later, when the jury returns... Howard's heart thuds in his chest. This is the moment he spent 18 months in prison waiting for. Howard feels himself grip the sides of the bench, the full weight of the decision hitting him. A conviction will mean he will miss all of Amber's childhood. It will mean abandoning Judy just a few months into their marriage. Finally, the foreman speaks. We find the defendant not guilty. Oh, my God. Howard leaves the dock in a daze. He rushes into Judy's warm embrace. They push through the throng of journalists waiting to greet them outside court, jump into the back of a waiting car. The minute they're on the move, they snog like teenagers in the back. When they finally pull apart, Judy is laughing. I can't believe you pulled it off. 
Finally, we can just start again. Jude, I'm not going straight. Judy's smile fades. Howard gives her his most seductive grin. Come on. If the trial proves anything, it's that I was born to do this. Oh, man. But you swore. Howard ignores the look of horror on Judy's face. He knows she'll come round. She always does. She has to. Because he's not done yet. And now that he can come out of the shadows, be Howard Marks again, he's sure the best and the biggest deals are still to come. Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. This is the second episode in our series, The Cannabis King. A quick note about our dialogue. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said, but all our dramatisations are based on historical research. If you'd like to know more about the story, you can read Mr Nice by Howard Marks, Hunting Marco Polo by Paul Eddy and Sarah Walden. And you can watch Banged Up Abroad, Season 7, Episode 10, a documentary from National Geographic. I'm Matt Ford. And I'm Alice Levine. British Scandal is a production of Wondery and Samizdat Audio. Wendy Granditer wrote this episode. Additional writing by Alice Levine and Matt Ford. Our sound design is by Rich Evans. Script editing by James Magniak. This episode was produced by Millie Chu. Our associate producer is Francesca Gelardi Quadrio Corsio. Our senior producer is Joe Sykes. Our series producer is Theodora Leludis for Wondery. Our executive producers are Rich Knight, Jessica Radburn, and Marshall Louis for Wondery. <laughs> <laughs>